praise. Come on, let's give him praise. Let's give him praise. Come on, he's a good God. Amen. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, bless him. Come on, come on, bless the Lord. Come on, I'm gonna ask you, come on, y'all way here in the back. Let's move up closer. Come on, let's give God some praise. Come on, let's move up a little closer. Get together and let the fire move from heart to heart, from breast to breast. Come on, let's praise God. Come on, he's good. Come on, let's bless the Lord. Come on, y'all too far back. Come on up closer. Come on, be obedient. Come on up closer. Let me see your face. Let me see your smile. Amen. God is good. Amen. And he's worthy to be praised. We're going to go to the throne of grace real quick. Father, we bless you. We thank you. We honor you because you are so good. You are better to us than we've been to ourselves. We thank you and we bless you for this pastor and for his wife. We thank you for this fellowship, God. God, as we go into your word, we ask you to give us understanding, give us knowledge, give us wisdom of your word, Father God. Let us leave here with something, Father God, to grasp on to and to hold on to, Father God, as we trust you in these last days. God, we bless you and we give you praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come on and celebrate God. Come on and celebrate God. Amen. Amen. You may take your seat if you can. Amen. We honor the Lord for our presence here on this afternoon. We give honor to Bishop Elect Oatman. Come on, celebrate the man of God. Come on, that's weak. Come on, celebrate the man of God. Come on, that's it. Amen. We honor his wife, co-pastor Alicia Oatman. Amen. We thank God for them. Amen. Amen. They have been like a father and a mother to us. Amen. I honor the Lord for my beautiful wife. Amen. And I bless God for her. Amen. Again, on Wednesday, we'll be celebrating 20 years of being married. Amen. I thank God Pastor Oatman and his wife were there. They played for our wedding. Amen. He even helped put the music to the song that I wrote, amen, and I bless God, amen, he was a blessing, amen, and I thank God for that, amen, thank God for all the ministers from Wildwood, we had Minister Harrison, Minister Clark, and Minister Harrell back there in the back, amen, I don't know if she wanted to come up front, amen, but we thank God for her being here, amen, she is our church mother now, amen, we bless God for her, amen. Also want to thank God for all the other members from Wildwood that came with us, amen, everyone did not come, Amen. But we thank God for those that came. Amen. We thank God that... Uh, did we reach our goal? Amen. Okay. All right. God bless you. I want to make sure we bless this man of God. He is worthy of it. Amen. You may not think he is, but he is. Amen. And we just bless God for him. Amen. Um, and I thank God because... As he shared some of the, uh, our, our story with you, amen. But I thank God I got saved at the age of 17. My wife got saved at the age of 12. Amen. And we just bless God because he's good, amen. I got saved in 1982. And what year is it now? 2000 what? So how many years is that? Huh? Huh? No, count it up again. 31 years. Amen. Because I got saved at 17. Amen. And I'll be, I am 47 now, and I'll be 48 in two weeks. Amen. So I bless God. God is a keeper. Amen. God can keep you if you want to be kept. Amen. They didn't tell you half of the story. Amen. I grew up in a drug infested neighborhood with gang war. Amen. And God said, didn't know my father till I was 39. Amen. Till I turned 39 was the first day I ever met my real father. Amen. And I thank God because I'm still a man. I never went to jail. I went to school. Amen. I went to college. Amen. God blessed me with a good job. Amen. And I bless God because he is good. And if God spares my life four more years at the age of 51, I'll be done working for the first for my first job. All right. For my first job because I'm going to keep on working. Amen. Because I love God. Amen. And I want to show young people that you need to have a work ethic. Amen. You need to have responsibility. Amen. And sometimes it's not going to come the way that you want it to come. It's not going to come on a bed of ease. It's going to take making some sacrifices. It's going to take work. Amen. That's what it's going to take. 
And it's going to take you making sacrifices. Amen. And I thank God. I was at church every day, seven days a week when I got saved. Because that's what it took. Because really, when you get saved, you don't have no power. And because you don't have no power, you need to stay around power until God empowers you with the power. Because if you don't have power and you go around and you mess around, you're going to get burnt. Because you don't have enough power to sustain your stuff and keep you. Until the Holy Ghost fills you. Amen. And when the Holy Ghost fills you, you'll have the power and the ability to be aware, be able to walk away from sin. All right? And that's what we need. That's lacking. We need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I mean, totally immersed in it. You know how you get immersed when you baptize? That's the kind of dip you need in the Holy Ghost. Because I'll share with you. When I got saved, my friend said, we're going to give you 30 days. You're going to be back with us. This is a phase you're going through. This is a fad that you're going through. And I love my friends. We, had, we grew up together. We hung out together. We played sports together. But I told him I've decided to serve the Lord. And I'm asking you to respect my decision that I made. Amen. And then they said, man, this is a phase you're going through. You're going to be, that's why I had to be in church seven days a week. People didn't understand me. They didn't understand it. Amen. They were watching pornos. I'm going to be honest with you. They were drinking. They were cursing all the time, doing whatever they wanted to do. You know, I wanted to be cool. So, you know, before I got saved, I was cursing too. But God saved me from that. The day he saved me, I haven't uttered a cuss word in 31 years. Took it out of my mouth. So that's why I'm here to tell you God is a keeper. Amen. He can keep you. Amen. I've been in situations where I could have cursed, but I didn't. Because I know God saved me from that. I'm dealing with crazy people every day. I'm dealing with fools every day. I'm dealing with people that come on the bus with an attitude. But you know what I do? I sing hymns and praise God. While I'm driving the bus and don't even pay them no attention. And you know what happens? They walk away or somebody will come and defend me. And I don't even have to utter a word. That's how God good is. Amen? Good God is. So that's why I'm here to tell you God can keep you, young people. You got to have the mind that I want to be saved. And I want to be kept. And I don't want to falter. And I don't want to mess up on God. Amen? And thank God, again, he blessed me with a beautiful wife. Before we got married, we courted four years. She said, let me finish college first, and then I'll marry you. I said, I don't got a problem with that, because if I love you, I'm willing to wait until you finish college. Amen. So we courted for, I say, about seven years before we even got married. And we didn't mess up. Amen. We didn't sleep together. Amen. We didn't commit to have sex. Amen. God kept us until we got married. Thank you. You don't got to dip and dive. Amen. If you want to be saved, God will keep you. Amen. Just commit to him. Amen. And we didn't have no chaperones. Amen. The Holy Spirit was our chaperone. Amen. When it got hot, we learned, how, we knew how to walk away. All right. And God will do that for you. But you got to be want to be committed to God. Huh? Because he's a keeper. So we waited seven years before we got married. Then I'll tell you. We dated three years before she went to college. And dated four year, more years after she was in college. Amen. And we was holy. All right. I can do the same for you. Amen. Kept us. Amen. So I bless God. Amen. We thank him because he's good. God's blessing us. We're about to put our house up for sale. Amen. Because God's going to move me somewhere else. Go Amen. Go Amen. And I'm believing God. Amen. I'm trusting him. God's going to show favor. Go Amen. Yes, he is. Amen. And he loves his people. Amen. We want to share with you real quick out of Psalms, the fifth chapter. And then we have two supporting scriptures. Amen. I'm going to do what I'm saying. I'm going to tag first lady and she's going to come and close it out. All right. All right. We want to encourage you. We want you to know that, listen, despite us living for the Lord, there are some conditions that we're going to meet. We're going to face. There are some obstacles 
and some challenges that we're going to face in our lives. Amen. But we want you to know that God is able to keep you in the conditions. Amen. That you don't have to falter in the conditions and you don't even have to give up. Because God is with you. Amen. The scripture tells me in Job that a man that's born of a woman is full of trouble in a few days. Doesn't matter who you are, if, if you're saved. It doesn't matter if you're saved or not saved. All of us are going to face some troubles in our lives. Amen. It is how you handle the trouble that's going to help you. Amen. It is who also is in your help with you in your trouble which helps us. See, the greatest thing is to having God on your side. Because when you get in trouble, God is able to get you out of the trouble. The worst problem is being unsaved, having trouble, and don't have God on your side. Because there's no one that can help you or can get in your trouble with you. You're in that trouble by yourself. And that's why many people have nervous breakdowns. Many people have uh, all kinds of problems and uh, physical ailments and mental ailments because God is not in the trouble with them. Come on, but because we're saved, God will get in our encounter because he's with us. And that's why we need to be encouraged because he's on our side. We have the greater than factor on our behalf. So we're going to share with you in Psalms, the fifth chapter, and we're going to focus on verse number 12, but we're going to share out of the whole text there. Then we're going to use Psalms 89, 15, and 18. And the last scripture we're going to use, 2 Corinthians Chronicles, the 16th chapter, verses number 9. Amen. Everybody got their Bibles, right? Yes. Huh? Yes. All right. You need to come with your Bible. Amen. Amen. You need your word. Amen. Uh, uh, like they say, American Express, you don't leave home what? You don't leave home without your American Express card. You don't leave home, saints, without your word. Amen. Huh? All right, you need that word. Amen. And see, we need to understand there's two things the enemy is going to always fight us on. Reading the word and being a worshiper. Number one, because he's mad because he got kicked out and he can no longer be a worshiper. So because he's not a worshiper no more, he don't want you to worship God. And number two, he doesn't want you to be empowered with knowledge. Because if you be empowered with knowledge, you're going to be dangerous. That's why many times you get sleepy when you start reading the Word. You don't get sleepy when you're on Internet or Facebook or nothing for hours. You know, your eyes don't even blink. Huh? You can stay on that thing for a whole day. But as soon as you get that Word, you start reading. Oh, you get tired. You get sleepy. You don't even know what came over you. Something passed, I just don't know. Something came over me. And I just got so sleepy and so tired, I started yawning crazy. Why? The enemy don't want you to be in power with the word. Because if you be in power with the word, you're going to be dangerous. And you're going to affect his kingdom. And he don't want that to happen. That's why he calls you to get so sleepy and so tired. Amen? Psalms 5 and 12. It says, for the Lord will bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compass him with a shield? All right, everybody read that, right? The Lord will bless the righteous with what? Favor. All right. The Lord will bless the righteous with favor. All right, going over to Psalms 89. Verses 15 to 18. It says, Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all day. And in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. For thou art the glory of their strength. And in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense. And the Holy One of Israel is our King. Amen. Amen. Going over to Chronicles, Second Chronicles, the 16th chapter. And we're just going to read verse number 9. 
Second Chronicles 16 and 9. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. What does that text say? Throughout what? The whole earth. That means not just in the United States, but throughout the whole earth. To show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Amen? The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth on our behalf. Amen? So that's why we cannot get slack. That's why we cannot get depressed. That's why we can't get down on the conditions that we find ourselves in. Because the condition is only temporary. Huh? It's only temporary. The condition is only really to bring glory to God. Uh, it is not for you to complain and murmur in your condition. The purpose of the condition is for you to give him praise. And when you give him praise, he'll work. So we want to talk from the subject of this, this afternoon or this evening, however you see the time right now. My condition is not my conclusion because I'm walking in the fog. My condition is not my conclusion because I'm walking in the fog. What does fog mean? Fog means the favor of God. Uh-huh. My condition is not my conclusion because I'm walking in the favor of God. Uh -huh. I'm walking. The scripture says that, listen, the, for the Lord will bless the righteous with favor and will compass him with the shield. In our text in the Psalms, the fifth chapter, we see here David was going through some situations. David was faced with some uh, obstacles that were hard, and we're going to face them. David was faced with being depressed in his situation because his own flesh and blood, his son Absalom was trying to kill him. Take him out of here. He wanted to destroy him. And sometimes in our circumstances, the enemy will try to speak to us and make us think God is not fighting for us. God, where is God? Is God going to show up for you? Where is God at? Where is, when is God going to show up? You've been praying all this time, but God says, I still want you to praise me and worship me despite the condition that you're in. Because that's not your conclusion. Uh-huh. Because... It's just permanent because why? You're walking in the favor of God. And that's why we share these scriptures with you because listen, God's eyes is going to and fro on your behalf and on my behalf. God is concerned about you. God cares about you. God loves you. Uh, when, we, when we thought about this, we began to look at the word condition. A condition is a noun. A condition means is a circumstance is the circumstances affecting the way in which people live or work with regard to their safety or well-being. That is a condition. Yes, yes, yes. The enemy will bring conditions our way. He will bring obstacles our way. He will bring situations our way. Yes. And he, this happened to David. And David was encountering some trouble. And David was encountering some difficult times. And David was encountering some sadness because someone that he really loved was trying to destroy him. Sometimes it's the people that's close to you who say that they're your friend. Sometimes it's a family member who say they love you. Huh? And, you, and, you're, uh, and you're being naive. Sometimes, sometimes you're going to have to step aside from them. Yes. And you can still love them from a distance. Yes, Lord. That's right. Amen. That's but right. you cannot always be up under their face. Because right. sometimes they are hating on you right. Right. when they see God blessing you. And because they don't want right. to live the same way you're living, they hate us. Amen. And sometimes they're even praying against you. Because the devil got his ends. If God got prayer warriors, if God got angels, you can believe the enemy got some imps that's working behind the scenes. And sometimes he's going to use ordinary people to shake and rattle your 
room. Huh? That's how the county to rattle you, to shake your tree. Bring those fruit off the tree. Huh? But you got to stay in the favor of God. Oh, uh, let me look up, give you the word favor. Favor is a special privilege, a right, uh, approval, or advantage, or support. Huh? Favor ain't fair all the time. And everybody ain't going to experience favor because everybody don't want to walk this way. Favor is for the righteous. Uh-huh. Let me give you the word fog. What fog is? Fog is a vapor condensed to fine, to fine particles of water suspended in the lower atmosphere that differentiates from clouds only in being near the ground. Ooh, look at that. Come on, check it out. Fog is near the ground. Favor is near the ground. Favor is near God's people. Where are we at? Huh? We're in the earth. We're on the ground. So the fall comes with to us near the ground. The favor surrounds us. The fog, when you're driving in the fog, it's difficult for you to see. And most of the time in the fog, you turn on the high beams and you're trying to see clear, but you really still can't see. But you're going why? By faith. So when I'm walking in the fog, I'm going by faith. I'm walking by faith in God, but the fog is around me because I'm surrounded by, but I'm walking in favor. So that's why your condition is not your conclusion. Because why? You're walking in the fog of God. What? The favor of God. God is with you. Don't be discouraged. God, listen, and that's what David was really telling us, trying to tell us in his songs. He said, despite what you're going through, despite what is happening, I want you to know that the favor of God is with you. You don't have to be alarmed. You don't have to be distressed. You don't have to get out of whack. You don't have to lose your salvation. You don't have to fall. You don't have to give in to depression. You don't have to give in to suicide. You don't have to give in to what the enemy is telling you in your ear. Because sometimes he's speaking in the other ear. Why? Because God's favor surrounds his people. In our text, David was distraught in distress. He was frustrated with things that were going on in his life. And sometimes the saints of God are in frustration. They're, de they're depressed. They're going through frustration. They're stressed out with what is going on. But I'm here to tell you, hallelujah, glory to God. I'm here to tell you that the favor of God is upon your life because God is working on your behalf. And sometimes we stay in the condition because we complain and murmur. Instead of giving praise. That's what happened to the children of Israel. They didn't have to stay in that desert place all that long time. But they started complaining and started murmuring. Even though God was working on their behalf. He was giving them quail when they was, when they was complaining. He gave them water when they said they was thirsty. Huh? And God will prove himself in our lives. Yes, he will. We just got to stay faithful. Yes. Uh, so he came at a crossroad in his life, David. Amen. And sometimes we're going to come through some crossroads. He came through a crossroad at his life. And so he wrote this song to encourage us. Uh -huh, no matter what we're going through in life, it is not your conclusion Amen. If, if, if we just trust God, God will bring us out. Uh, if, if, if we just trust him, God will bring us out. We must understand that God is greater than our condition. That God is greater than our circumstances. God is greater than the situations that we are encountering. God is greater than my financial problem. God is greater than my sickness. God is greater than any situation that I'm going through. He's greater than. And if we begin to trust him, God will begin to do things on our behalf. If we will just stay rooted and grounded and stay faithful to God, God will bring us out of the circumstances if we continue to walk in the favor of God and don't look at the condition but look at God. 
Uh, as I think about this, my mind begins to go to the three Hebrew boys. Uh -huh, they had a condition, and, and listen, they were coming up against a king who did not know their God or even was acquainted with their God. But they said, listen, king, we're not going to even bow down to what you're saying. And sometimes in the things that we are encountering, the enemy is trying to get us to bow down to him. But I'm here to tell you, stand for God. Stand your ground for God. No matter what condition and when they stood for God, listen, the king even had to recognize who God was. Listen, God, listen, they said, King, we're not going to answer, be willing to answer you about this thing. We're not even going to bow to you. I don't care what you say. I don't care if you heat the furnace up a hundred times, hotter than what it is. We're not going to bow down to you. So the king got mad. And listen what I'm telling you. Because God surrounded them when they went to throw them in the furnace, they didn't even get burnt. The people that threw them in did, though. Huh? And I'm telling you, when you walk in the fog, nothing will happen to you because God will get in the fog with you. Yeah. Nothing will happen to you because God will get in your condition with you. And see, when they threw him in there, listen, the king peeped in the thing and said, look, I see three. I know I put three in there, but it looks like a fourth one who is the son of man walking in the midst of the fire with them. Listen, their clothes didn't get burnt the same way they was put in, the same way they came out of it. And listen, the king had to recognize, listen, they serve a great God. They serve a God that's awesome. They serve a God that is powerful. And that's why I'm telling you, your condition is not your conclusion because God is going to bring you out of this. You don't have to stay in it. Most of us stay in the problem because we want people to feel sorry for us. We want people to pet us. We want people to put a band-aid over our wounds. We want people to put a pamper on us and put a pacifier in our mouth and put us in the playpen. But I'm here to tell you, it's time for you to get strong in God. Uh -huh. Listen, he said, the kingdom of God suffers violence and a violent taken by force. You won't have to get a violent spirit. If you want to survive in this 30, 21st century, you can't have a passive spirit. You can't have a wimpy spirit. You can't have a Burger King spirit. You're going to have to have an aggressive, uh, listen, because we're in the midst of a kingdom clash. You got to understand this. We're in the midst of kingdoms clashing. We're in the midst of God clashing and Satan clashing together. And we're just pawns in the midst of it. Amen. But God said, listen, I know my people. I'm going to surround the people with my favor. No matter what condition they're in. Listen, you can be in, you can have no money in the bank and God can call somebody to walk up and give you a thousand dollars. Because you're in the favor of God. Listen, I, I, I'm going to tell you, I'm a witness because on Monday when I, pu I pulled up on my route and I seen a friend that I haven't seen in, I say, at least two years because he was out sick. You know what he did? He pulled $540 out and said, put this in the church. Cash money, $100 bills. Didn't ask it for him and didn't see him in a year. Come on now. The next day he, I pulled up, he gave me $140 and said, put it in the church. My God. My God. See, we're looking at conditions, and God is trying to get us to get a spiritual eye. Yes. He's trying to get us to get out of what we see. Because yes, we're seeing things through our eyes, and our eyes are going to mess us up. Don't want us to see. Listen, we got to start seeing things as God sees. We got to see it in the invisible, and God will bring it through in the visible. But we got to start seeing it. That's why we need to stay in prayer. That's why we need to stay in the word. Because when we get distracted by this other stuff, and that's all that other, that television, whatever they're called, that, that, that's fantasy TV, what is it called? Reality TV. It's a distraction. It's to get us focused off God and the kingdom, what's going on. And we got to turn it off. Amen. We got to get radical, some of us, and we got to put the TV out the house or out the bedroom. Amen. You know, you're crazy. You're talking crazy. You're going to need some of it that to survive. Come on now. What's going on? Huh? I'm telling you, if you want the favor of God. Huh? We are in the midst of kingdom clashes. All right, all right. 
Yes. In the midst of the kingdoms clashing, we got to walk in the favor of God. All right. That's right. God ain't worried about your credit. You could have jacked it up when you was unsaved. He ain't worrying about that because he can straighten it out when you saved. He said, God, we get down begging God. You ain't got to beg him. You ain't got to beg him. You need to delight yourself in him. And when you start delighting yourself in him, he'll give you the desires of your heart. You need to start seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We get caught up in things. And we need to get caught, stop getting caught up in things. You got a you got a closet full of shoes already. You don't need no more. Come on. But you want more. You're like the man in the scripture. And, and, and listen, I'm guilty of it too sometimes. We're like the man in Luke the 12th chapter. He had barns and they were filled, but he wanted to tear the barns down and build bigger barns. Huh? To put more what in it? Stop. And what happened? And the scripture says his soul was required where? But his soul was required where? His soul was required by God in hell. And God said that now who's going to spend the stuff that you, what's people going to do with the stuff that you left? That's right. They're going to be wearing it. They're going to be spending it. They're going to be driving it. And they're going to be living in it. So God wants us to get connected to walking in the favor. Seeking him. Loving him. I'm about to tag first lady. Amen. Three points I want to get out. There's three requirements of walking or in the fog. One, you need a prayer life. Requirements. What are the requirements of living in the fog? Prayer. Yeah. David looked at that and David said, I must begin to stay. Listen, he said, my voice shall be heard in the morning, O Lord. Verses number three. In the morning while I direct my prayers unto you, I will look up. For thou art not a God that has pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Amen. He was seeking God early in the morning. Amen. We need to make, listen. Uh, uh, you, need to, you need the purpose in your heart to get up. Listen. I get up. I, I get up at three o'clock in the morning to go to work. I set my alarm clock for two thirty because I at least want to get a half an hour of prayer Amen. before I even go to work. Amen. Because that sets the tone of your day. Yes, that sets your atmosphere. Yes, that set God surrounding you Thank with His you, favor. Jesus. That sets God giving His angels charge yes. over you. And you need to make. You need listen. Sometimes you need to go to bed early. Yes. Yes. And what I did, I love sports. So I sometimes I'll stay up to watch it. But now I started. To, listen, they ain't giving me nothing in my pocket for me to stay up that late. The, I, listen, I, it, it came to my mind a light bulb flash. They're making millions of dollars to stay up that late to play sports and bang each other and shoot the ball in the hoop. And I'm just a plain old man staying up this late, get, trying to get all my sleep to go to work. And they're making millions. And the next day they can sleep in as long as they want to. They ain't got to get up to work. But I do. Because I'm making less than what they making. So that light bulb flash, man, you better go to bed. <laughs> so I don't even care about the score sometimes no more. I just turn off my TV and go to bed. Because I really need to get, use that time. I can use that time for prayer in the morning. To keep the enemy off my trail. To keep me from giving in to his tactics or his yes, tricks. Yes. Amen. And sometimes we need to lay before God. Yes, yes. So I spend at least a half an hour laying before God. Sometimes God don't even allow me to say nothing. He just want to talk to me. Yes. He wants to pour into me. Yes. And that's what sometimes God want to do. Sometimes you wonder, well, I can't pray. Why well, God just wants you to sit up and shut up. So he can speak to you. Be quiet. Yes. Zip your mouth. Yes. So that he can pour into you. So he can give you direction. So he can give you instruction. And you yes. sitting there saying, Lord, I need this. He said, shut up. Yes. All right. wow. I know what you have need of. Let me speak to you. Yes. 
prayer should be daily, intentional, early, purposefully, and delight. It should be a delight. Where I want to pray. Where I want to go into the presence of the Lord. And in the beginning, it's not going to be a delight. But as God starts moving, and God starts moving on your behalf, and as it's some, in the beginning, it might be a struggle. Until God starts moving and God starts answering prayer, then it's going to become a delight and you're going to be, look, I want to, I want to see, why didn't it do this early? That's what it takes. That's what happens. As you start getting into it, as God starts answering prayers, as you start interceding for other people and you stop worrying about yourself and stuff and you start praying for other people, people that you know are sick or God wake you up and say, I need you to pray for sister such and such today. Stop praying for yourself and pray for that person. Amen. If the Lord puts pastor on your heart, you pray for pastor that whole day. You intercede for him. Point number two. The requirement is I got to live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. They that come to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those that do what? Sometimes. Once a month. Once a week. Three times a week. Diligent means every day, all the time. Even when I'm working, even when I'm working, I'm praying on the inside. Even when I'm driving the bus, people might think I'm crazy, but I'm singing hymns and I'm praying. It has to be. It's not going to be spent time on your knees all the time. But I must believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I cannot doubt. Sometimes we have trouble believing God because of our relationships with people. Huh? The example was, if your father hadn't been in your life, it's going to be hard for you to trust God as father or as daddy. Because you're used to your father disappointing you. So sometimes when God doesn't answer you fast enough, you're disappointed by him, so you doubt God and you don't trust him. That happens. That helps. That makes us waver in faith. Because I can't identify with a father. Because I never had a real father. But what happens is God will put men in your life that will be a spiritual father. So that you have some kind of inclination of what a father is. So you can really trust God. And depend on him. And know that God is going to show up. And sometimes, listen, he said, I'll be a father and a mother to the fathers. So you can trust God. You can depend on him. God is not a God that he should lie. So we got to get out of not being able to trust God because of our experiences in the natural. He tells us, I'm not like man. I'm not like man. I'm not going to treat you like your daddy who disappointed you and let you down. I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to prove to you that I love you. I did it already when I sent my son to die for you, to give you a chance at eternal life. I could have left you out on the streets and could have raised somebody else up, but I chose to save you. You could be sleeping on a crate of steam today, but I chose to save you. It could have been you in jail today and your friend out of jail. You could have stayed in prostitution, but I delivered you. You could have stayed on drugs, but I delivered you. I gave you my son to prove to you that I love you and that I care about you and that I'm concerned about you. So I need you to walk in faith. And the point number three, and I'm going to tag first lady, number three is obedience. We need to start walking in obedience. We need to start walking in obedience. Listen, it's not about what you feel. It's not about what you think. Amen. It's about what God says. And if you're going to be blessed, you're going to have to do it God's way and not your way. If you're going to have favor, it has to be on God's terms. And not your turn. You can't haggle with God. And some of us are trying to have God, if you do this for me, I promise you, that's haggling. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
then you're really not going to come forth with your promise because you're never going to keep it. I promise you, Lord, if you get me out of debt this time, I know. And you wind up getting a new credit card and you run that one up. So you can't have it with God. You got to obey his word. Huh? You got to be obedient in your giving. What did he tell Abraham? When Abraham was about to take the knife and kill Isaac, he says, no, now I know you're not willing to withhold anything from me. You're willing to walk in obedience because you were willing to offer up your sons. Put that thing down. I got a ram in the bush. I know that you're willing to go to the extremes for me. That's what God's looking for. People that will go to the extremes for him in obedience. I don't care what my friends say. I'm walking in obedience. I don't care what everybody else say. They can tell me, Pastor crazy. I'm going to listen to what pastors say more than I'm listening to what you say. And what happens is some of us got other people's ears. I'm sorry, not ears, other people's voice. We're listening to strange voices. And strange voices are getting us in trouble. Huh? I got to walk in obedience. I might not feel like it. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm saved. How do you know you're saved? Because I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart. Sometimes you're going to wake up, you ain't going to feel saved. Huh? But I believe I'm saved because I've confessed and believed. It's not based on my feelings, my emotions. God doesn't operate in that. You can't get emotional and try to think you're going to get emotional on God. You see some little tears. Oh, no, no, no. Them tears don't move God. You promised me, God. You promised you was going to be obedient. There's some conditions that got to be met. You promised that you would be a giver. Right? So he says, you give sparingly, what you going to reap? I mean, you give sparingly, you're going to reap what? You give a dollar, what's going to come back to you? So we got to learn how to be obedient. Everybody in here want to be blessed, right? Huh? But are you willing to take what, are you willing to do what it takes to be blessed? That's the key. And a lot of us are not willing to do what it takes to be blessed. That means make sacrifices. That means when I don't feel like coming to church, I'm still going to come. Right. Even when I don't feel like it. Right. That means even when I don't feel like praying, I'm going to get up and pray. Yes. Even when I don't feel like praying. Right. Uh, that means that when the pastor calls for a business meeting, when I don't feel like going, I'm going to go. Because all of us practice it. Everybody in here feel like going to work? No. Huh? No. But what happened? Why? Because I want to get what? Huh? And also, I got to pay them bills. So even when I'm sick, what do I do? I do what? I go to work. Why? Why can't we do that for God then? Why does God got to take the slack? Why does he always got to take the slack? Oh, I ain't feeling good today, Pastor. I'm going to stay home. You don't stay home from that boss. Huh? You get the boss eight hours. If they tell you to do overtime, you'll stay. But when pastor say, it's all night prayer, we're going to fast. What? Come on now. We get crazy. <laughs> but we don't do that on God. We do it all on God. We treat God like God don't even exist. Sometimes. God gets the worst. He gets the slack. He gets the less leftovers, but we always want him to bless us. Yeah. Give me a new car, God. Give me a new house, God. Oh, God, give me a wife. Give me a husband. Yeah. But what are you willing to do for God? Right. Are you willing to get out on the streets? When they say we need to go out and witness and pass our tracks, how many people show up? Come on. Come on. Huh? Come on. Where's everybody at then? When we need to clean the church, where's everybody at? Right. Oh, they home sleeping. <sighs> sleeping real good. But you know what cracks me up about that? 
Most of the people that don't do nothing is always complaining. Right. 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 Most of the people that don't do nothing, oh, they ain't doing that right. They ain't doing that right. Pastor, I don't know what he talking about. He always begging for money. Most of the people that don't give is always complaining. Come on, honey, I'm going to tag you. Because I'm about to go to another level. And I don't want to go there. Most of the people that don't do nothing, that barely give, is the one that complains. Yes, sir. We got to do better in the kingdom. We got to do better. All right. So we got to meet the faith requirement. We got to meet the prayer requirements. And we got to walk in obedience. Obedience means, listen, he said, if you be willing and obedient, you shall be what? You shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be cursed with a curse. So what you put in your hand to do when you ain't walking in obedience, you know, you cursing your own self. I may not feel like it, but I'm going to do it. You know what? I, I didn't always, I didn't always believe everything. Or trust, believe everything, or did everything my pastor said. But I obeyed it. My pastor said, boy, you a minister now. You can't wear a mustard suit. I like, I just paid for this mustard suit. This thing is nice. You know what? I ain't argue with it. I took the suit off when I got home, and I gave it to somebody else. I could have got, I could have said, man, they crazy. I'm... Listen, we got to learn sometimes to be obedient to our leaders. We may not understand it all the time. But I took it off and I gave it away. And I ain't never wear it again. And I ain't suck my teeth. And I ain't get mad. And I paid good money for that suit. But look, hey. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Huh? Huh? All right, and I ain't get thrown all the whack. I ain't backslide. I ain't say I ain't going to church no more. That's some of us that do that. The pastor rebuke us and chastise us, and we need it. I ain't going to church no more. They just hurt my feelings. Sometimes you need rebuke. All right, here you go, honey. Thank you. I'm done. Come on, let's put our hands together and get the Lord. Is not my conclusion. Not my conclusion. Because, I'm because I'm walking in the fall. In the fall. And so as I thought about what Pastor said, he gave us the requirements. And I'm going to talk about the benefits, amen, of walking in the fall. I'm so glad that my pain, I'm so glad that my hurt, I'm so glad that my disappointment, I'm so glad that my sickness, I'm so glad that the distractions, I'm so glad that those things that are un it's not my conclusion. How many of us have some conditions right now? You got something going on right now. And the enemy wants to tell you that that's going to be your end. But if you look at somebody and tell them that's not my end. What I'm going through is not going to be my demise. What I'm going through is not going to be my conclusion. What I'm going through is not going to last always. The Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but what comes in the morning? comes in the morning. So I'm so glad that the Bible says that he knows the plans that he has for me. He knows the thoughts that he thinks towards me. And they're of good and not of evil. And they have to take me to my expected end. How many of you know that God has an expected end for us? The devil meant it for my bad. But God said he's turning it around for my good. He's turning it around for my good. He's turning it around for my good. He's turning it around for, I guess you haven't been through nothing. He 